I'm Dr. Ellie Anderson, philosophy professor and co-host of Overthink Podcast, and today I'm introducing some ideas from Albert Camus' book, The Myth of Sisyphus. I'm going to focus specifically on the idea of the absurd. I really encourage you to check out the book if you haven't already. He's very much a thinker who is associated with this notion of the absurd or absurdity, absurdism. Uh, so. Camus begins the book by saying that the problem of suicide is the only truly serious philosophical problem. Hamlet's question of whether life is worth living, to be or not to be, is where philosophy should begin. The meaning of life, Camus says, is the most urgent of questions. So he's interested in what he calls the individual point of view. Why should I continue on? And he says that when we ask this question, we reveal a vulnerability to the universe that the universe cannot assuage. The universe cannot respond to us and tell us why life is worth living. It cannot respond and tell us what the meaning of life is. And so we find ourselves in a strange situation in which we call out to the world for meaning and the world cannot give us that meaning in response. This is what Camus calls the absurd. He says that the absurd is a divorce between our desire for meaning and the world's silence in the face of it. It's an unceasing struggle. The divorce between a person and their life the actor and their setting, he says, that's on page six, is properly the feeling of absurdity. The absurd, Camus says, is born of the confrontation between human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. And this feeling of the absurd is not the notion of the absurd, he states, but lays the foundation for it. And both feeling and notion of the absurd don't exist inside the self or subject or out there in the world. Rather, the absurd is a relational notion and a relational feeling that exists in that between space, between the world and myself. It's not in one or the other. The feeling of absurdity is elusive, Camus thinks. It's not something that we can know completely or pin down completely. And so the feeling of the absurd is actually a lot broader than the notion of the absurd. And he describes this feeling of the absurd as an odd state of the soul in which the void becomes eloquent. The nothing overpowers us. And we move from being carried by time to feeling like we need to carry time. So there's this sense of overwhelm and yet also a strange sense of responsibility or freedom, we might say, as the nothing presents itself to us and, and puts us in this odd state of soul. Now, I think that, um, so I'm using this, this edition here, page 12 and 13 are really interesting for describing how this nothing arises. And Camus here is uh, drawing a lot of tropes that exist already in existential philosophy by the time that he is writing this. this uh, what I'm about to read about nothingness has resonance with Kierkegaard and Heidegger and Sartre on their views of nothingness. He says, in certain situations, replying nothing when asked what one is thinking about may be pretense in a man. Those who are loved are well aware of this. But if that reply is sincere, if it symbolizes that odd state of soul in which the void becomes eloquent, in which the chain of daily gestures is broken, in which the heart vainly seeks the link that will connect it again, then it is, as it were, the first sign of absurdity. And I love the, the example that he's giving in the next sentence. Camus was a playwright and an actor as well, so that helps situate why he might be using the following metaphor. It happens that the stage sets collapse. Rising, streetcar, four hours in the office or the factory, meal, streetcar, four hours of work, meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. This path is easily followed most of the time. But one day the why arises, and everything begins in that weariness tinged with amazement. <laughs> 
What Camus has just been describing is what he calls in this text mechanical life, the way that we usually go around in our everyday life with a sort of linear sense of time. Uh, we're busy. We've got a ton of things to do. And we don't really pause and reflect on the why. But then suddenly the why arises. And part of what's so interesting about this, and this why will be the origin of the feeling of the absurd, is that it's not triggered by anything in particular. And in this sense, Camus' uh, notion of the absurd is, is pretty similar to Heidegger's notion of the uncanny and some of what Kierkegaard says as well about anxiety and despair. It seems to come as if from nowhere, as if from certainly outside of ourselves, but not being triggered by anything in particular. And once we become aware, Camus thinks, we have a couple of options. We can either have what he calls, we can either just return to mechanical life and be like, oh, whoa, <laughs> that question of why was scary. Never mind, forget it, cross it out, go back to mechanical life. Or we can have what he calls a definitive awakening of consciousness, where we continue to peer around and we hold on to that uncomfortable feeling of why. This uncomfortable feeling of why that we hold on to in the definitive awakening, he says, can either lead to suicide, and that could either be a real suicide, or it could be what he calls philosophical suicide, which is the move of recognizing that there is this absurd condition, but ultimately rejecting it and saying, actually, the world does make sense for XYZ reasons through reverting to some philosophical system or other source of meaning. Or there's what Camus calls the recovery. When we recover, we are not rejecting the absurdity. We're not rejecting the feeling of the absurd. This is a definitive awakening such that we are constantly holding to the feeling of the absurd and ironically actually revolting against it. Camus envisions awakening to the absurd in this definitive sense as a permanent revolt. And the figure that he uses, who's the titular figure of the myth of Sisyphus, is the protagonist of this ancient Greek myth, this guy is Sisyphus. Sisyphus is doomed by the gods to roll a rock up a hill for eternity, and he rolls this huge, huge rock up the hill. It's really hard, takes a long time, and then when he gets to the top of the hill, he's finally made it, the rock rolls back down, and Sisyphus has to roll it back up again, over and over again for truly eternity. And Camus suggests that, sure, Sisyphus's actions appear to be sort of the epitome of mechanical life. But the way that Sisyphus relates to that mechanical life makes all the difference. Because once you awaken to the absurd, you're not necessarily going to actually change your life. In fact, your life could continue on very, very similarly, perhaps indistinguishably to before. But what has changed is your attitude towards it. You are awakened to the absurdity and you are continually revolting against it uh, through your attitude of awareness to it. The absurd, he says, is not something that can be overcome. Overcoming the absurd means resolving this fundamental gap between our desire for meaning and the unreasonable silence of the world. And if we overcome that gap, we dissolve it and there just is no absurd anymore. And so in order to stay true to the character of existence, Camus thinks, we need to preserve this gap, even as we continually revolt against it. He says the absurd must be preserved, but not agreed to. This might sound a little bit paradoxical. So let me talk a little bit more about why Camus thinks this is the case. So he thinks that we preserve the absurd through awareness of it, and also through what he calls living without appeal. The world, he thinks, is neither rational nor irrational. It is simply irrational, let's say. Um, but we can only understand in human terms. Meaning is a human problem. Understanding and consciousness separate us from creation. So it's impossible to know if there is an order outside of ourselves that is rational, and yet we seek one. Living without appeal is about resisting our desire to put the world into the categories of our understanding and our consciousness. And this relates to what I said before about revolt. Now, revolt specifically comes up when Camus is talking about the three consequences of the absurd. The first consequence is revolt. 
He says that life is actually lived better if it has no meaning. And living is keeping the absurd alive. And we keep the absurd alive through this revolt. And revolt gives life value. Revolt for him is simply an awareness that is preserved. And so it actually might seem that the way that Camus is talking about revolt is completely ineffectual because it just has to do with this attitude of mind. And indeed, I think that is the case in this text. He's, as I said earlier, not saying that you need to radically change your life in terms of the material conditions and the activities that you're doing in order to be aware of the absurd. So I think there is that danger here. And some of the examples that Camus uses later in the text of the absurd men are problematic for various reasons. But I will say that, um, I don't know, not to like appeal to Camus' own life here too much, but Camus was himself very, very politically active. So at least in his own life, he didn't see this notion of revolt as condemning us to the status quo because it was just a matter of changing your attitude. He still saw it fit to act in ways that align with your political desire for transformation of the existing world. The second consequence of the absurd for him is freedom. We can only experience our own freedom, not that of others. And freedom, he thinks, is invalid as an abstract philosophical question. He has absolutely no interest in the debates over free will. Not interested in that. He thinks that we act as if we are free, and that is enough. That's all we have access to, right, is our sense of our own freedom. Kind of a Kantian claim in a weird way. Um, and so he says, for instance, on page 57, that thinking of the future, establishing aims for oneself, having preferences, all this presupposes a belief in freedom, even if one occasionally ascertains that one doesn't feel it. So... For him, even our orientation toward the future and our goal setting, whether it's like big goals or little goals, even our preferences for what we're going to have for our next meal or who we're going to hang out with tonight, those are all indicative that we have this sense of our own freedom. And it doesn't really matter whether that maps on to some external metaphysical reality of freedom. The third consequence of the absurd is passion, uh, which basically means living without appeal to something higher. So living without appeal is living without appeal to a higher truth or a reality or something that would be secure, something that would give us respite from this absurd condition that we find ourselves in. And Camus has this ethic, um, this ethic of quantity that he develops in this essay, where he says that seeking the maximum quantity of experiences is the expression of passion. And in this sense, we should discard value judgments about which actions are better and worse in favor of what he calls factual judgments and get rid of the idea that there is a hierarchy of the quality of experiences. He also thinks that we can only judge ourselves. He thinks that we can't live by a moral code without appealing to something higher. And so living without appeal means actually eschewing a moral code. And all systems of morality depend on consequences that justify the action, but we can't actually judge the present based on the future because the future isn't lived yet. So how can we know what consequences are going to justify the action in the future? Now, you might say that Camus has a artificially narrow view of what morality is in this sense, because by focusing on consequences, he is arguably just talking about utilitarian morality. That is a separate issue. The bottom line is really that he thinks that this moral code involves an appeal to something higher and a dependence on consequences. And we just can't have knowledge of that given our situatedness in the present. The absurd you might think if it doesn't involve a moral code, if it involves the sense that we can't actually judge others or be judged by them, is fundamentally liberating. But Camus also says that the absurd binds rather than liberates. It binds us. It's, it's binding us to our existence. Because we don't have appeal to anything higher, we actually have to take a radical responsibility. He says that we are responsible even if we are not guilty. 